There's a lot of episodes of cartoons that you may have really hated growing up. A lot of the most hated episodes usually have some common frustrations, like no one will listen to the main characters, but sometimes there's questionable morals, like proving a character is a detriment to the entire world and it's better off without them. Or a character should be abused for the sake of their family, which growing up I thought there was possibly some complex, poignant sentiment behind this episode, and god I was a stupid kid. I'd like to preface while this video is talking about a few episodes that are key examples of animated atrocities, like you see by Mysterious Mr. Enter. This video isn't to throw shade at him or anyone else, because I really liked the content of Mr. Enter and Nostalgia Critic growing up. And even though they can be seen as kind of cringe and overly critical, I thought there were some interesting things I could learn from them and their perspectives, even if I didn't always agree with their takes. I've studied animation for a little over a decade, and I've come to the conclusion that it's a miracle anything at all shows up on a television screen because of just how much goes into even a single second of animation. And while it's not a justification for shows to be bad, I think it motivates me to be more vocal about episodes that I actually like, as opposed to why shows fail. So let's start with the Hey Arnold episode where he gets crucified for wearing bunny pajamas. Arnold Betrays Iggy In Arnold Betrays Iggy, Arnold catches his cool classmate Iggy at his home wearing bunny pajamas. It's kinda random and funny, but Iggy has a big reputation as a cool kid, so he makes Arnold swear not to tell anyone. Arnold obliges, but the next day on the bus when Sid and Stinky ask Arnold about seeing Iggy, he laughs to himself about the situation and tells the boys he can't say why he's laughing. Oh, come on, how bad could it be? I mean, it wasn't like he was wearing bunny pajamas or something. Boy, you're pulling my leg, right? I didn't say anything. Iggy wears bunny pajamas? So Sid and Stinky then spread the embarrassing news to the whole school, which causes Arnold to be the bad guy and isn't forgiven by Iggy. This presents two big problems a lot of people have with this episode. First, some people feel Arnold didn't do a good enough job trying to protect the secret because he says he's laughing because of Iggy and he couldn't lie and deny when they magically guessed that Iggy was wearing bunny pajamas. Which I find a little silly because like, one of Arnold's most endearing character traits is how honest he is, so not being able to lie better about the situation doesn't bother me. You know, he didn't have malintent or anything. The other big aspect is that Sid and Stinky are the ones who spread the rumor to the whole school, not Arnold, and yet Arnold is the regretful one and isn't forgiven, and Sid and Stinky never get punished for their actions. But I gotta say, I've had moments like this in my life when I was a kid where I was really insecure and embarrassed. Like, I remember telling my friend, oh, I like this new show called El Tigre, but don't tell anyone. Next day at school, someone comes up to me and goes, Colby's so gay, he probably watches El Tigre. And my, like, first subconscious response was to look at my friend that I confided in, and he goes, What? I didn't tell him. Which turned into, Oh my god, he really does. Oh my god. And, like, El Tigre was a gem from a legendary artist and director, so it's about time I stand up for it. I remember being annoyed at my friend for, like, I don't know, an hour or two, but I didn't really hold it against him. I was more like, Wow, that other dude's a dick. But I think this distribution of blame is important to know, because when I see Iggy resent Arnold more than Sid and Stinky, there's part of it that feels pretty real even though it's not 100% rational or logical. And it's important to know the kids, as well as myself in the story, are like 10 years old and kids do stupid stuff sometimes, you know? Anyways, Arnold talks to Grandpa about the situation and how he accidentally betrayed a friend, and the lesson Grandpa gives Arnold is to apologize, explain calmly and rationally how the situation happened, and if he still doesn't forgive him, buy his forgiveness. Iggy doesn't accept Arnold's apology, which is understandable, cause like, he's still getting constantly harassed at school, and I think the biggest point in favor of Iggy, or why this episode can be hard to sympathize with, is because this aspect of getting constantly harassed all day at school has nothing that can really make it up. I can totally understand why Iggy holds a grudge against Arnold, even if it wasn't Arnold's fault or intention. But Iggy just kinda gets worse and worse throughout the episode, because Arnold apologizes and brings Iggy his favorite chocolates, and Iggy just slams the door in Arnold's face, and I think to myself, you know, Iggy's just pretty unlikable. Like, taking the chocolates and slamming the door and giving Arnold a silent treatment otherwise is just pretty crazy. Arnold even resorts to doing Iggy's chores for a whole week to gain his forgiveness, which Iggy agrees to, and at the end of the week, Iggy says, nah, just kidding, how could I ever forgive you? And this is where the episode puts Iggy undoubtedly in the wrong, like, to the point of no return. 
Like at this point, Arnold should have just said, okay, I've done everything I could, everyone else is your real problem, bye, goodbye. But Arnold's so committed to making things right, as we've seen so many times throughout the show, that Arnold agrees to walk outside wearing the bunny pajamas. People say this part doesn't really make sense, like why would the whole town be waiting to watch a kid walk outside in his pajamas? But from my perspective, I kind of think, why would it be so embarrassing for Arnold to wear the bunny pajamas, when the whole town already knows it's in reference to Iggy? Like if I saw Arnold doing this, I'd say, oh, he's making fun of Iggy. That's funny, I guess. But to the episode's credit, it creates a very strong visual and climax to the episode with the whole town, even the news station, waiting for Arnold to walk the red carpet. We wouldn't take it as seriously if he walked outside without a big crowd, or maybe if he just showed up to school like this, but they really play this out almost like a public execution. Speaking of public execution, this is probably the only moment I'll get to mention the cover art for the storyboards of this episode, which have Arnold quite literally stabbing Iggy in the back like a direct parody of the assassination of Julius Caesar, which is pretty crazy. Like, I saw this and was like, oh my god. It's going to be all I can bear to watch and take pictures for the album. <laughs> <laughs> this line made a lot of people mad, but like, come on, it's a joke. Sid and Stinky talk about how they feel bad for Arnold, especially since it was them who caused the secret to leak, not Arnold. And when Iggy overhears this, he desperately tries to stop Arnold to no avail. We see the whole town laugh at Arnold, and it's even broadcast on the news. Like, as crazy as it is, it's a pretty good exaggeration. Arnold takes one last look at the now regretful Iggy and walks back inside. Later, we see Iggy waiting on Arnold's front steps, pleading for Arnold's forgiveness, but he just walks away, giving Iggy the silent treatment. I think the episode has such an interesting tone and conclusion. Like, it doesn't have a conventional happy ending like most episodes of the show, so I can see why a lot of people dislike it, but I think it has similar morals to other episodes like An Eye for an Eye makes the whole world blind. But beyond this, I think the episode's a unique, risk-taking episode about betrayal, revenge, and for a series that has so many deeper episodes about these aspects, and of characters that don't fit into society like Pigeon Man or even Monkey Man, I I think there's more merit to this episode than is given. So let's move on to another beloved show, The Powerpuff Girls, with the episode Equal Fights. Equal Fights is often in debate of whether it's aged like wine or milk, as it tackles the topics of feminism, misogyny, and misandry. I think it's a good episode that's often misinterpreted as some epic own of feminists when, like, it was written and boarded in part by Lauren Faust, the creator of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. So yeah, let's see what this episode really has to say, and if it's a good episode of the Powerpuff Girls or not. The episode starts with the Powerpuff Girls getting a call about the bank being robbed. When they arrive, they see a woman, femme fatale, insulting all the men in the bank, and I gotta say, she has a pretty great design. I really like this image of her as a JoJo character, because her design translates really well to anime, but I guess all the characters did. Or at least, most of them. Femme Fatale doesn't want the $100 bills, because they have men on them, and instead robs people exclusively in Susan B. Anthony coins. When she's caught by the Powerpuff Girls, she talks to them about how the city belittles their talents and girls gotta stick together, and this is where the episode might get a little bit muddled. Because her main point for why the city belittles the Powerpuff Girls' talents is pretty indirect. She talks about how there's hardly any superheroes, and the few there are like Supergirl and Batgirl are kind of extensions of male superheroes. The girls eventually decide to let Femme Fatale go, as we see a montage of her wreaking havoc on the town with no interference, ending in her laughing to herself in her apartment filled with Susan B. Anthony coins, a female symbol lamp, and pomegranates which represent femininity and fertility. There's also a cat licking another cat, and uh, I don't know what that means, but maybe it's like Cow and Chicken where the Buffalo Gals, a group of biker women, break into their homes and start chewing on their carpets. And if you don't follow, one of the main bikers was named Munch Kelly. This was like 25 years before Ice Spice. Anyways, the Powerpuff Girls begin acting pretty hostile towards all the guys they know, like a boy throwing a dodgeball at a girl, or the professor asking the girls for help with the chores, to even the mayor asking them to save the day. The episode is structured pretty well because it shows these things happening at the beginning of the episode without any problems, but it's only once the girls begin thinking about these things with the lens of this new, extreme perspective that they view them as a problem. And while the structure is good, the specific examples of what they react to is probably the biggest flaw of this episode, because there's a lot of valid issues women go through, especially in the early 2000s, but none of these are really used here. One example that seems like a really easy layup from the early 2000s is the impossible body standards given to women. Like, look at this picture of Mariah Carey. 
Looks pretty good, doesn't it? Well, she was called fat for this. And Jumbo Jessica is one of the more infamous images of fat shaming I can think of. Even Britney Spears was called fat a lot. There's so much that can be said about the sexualization of women or the body standards and the possible eating disorders that come with these. But I guess they were trying to approach more of a woman belong in the kitchen perspective by having the girls object to chores and stuff. Miss Bellum calls the girls to her office, where she, along with her teacher Miss Keen, have a talk with the girls. The visuals and tone of this scene are really cool to me, having this dramatic, harsh lighting and the long shadows of the room without any music or sound effects really makes this a nice heart to heart. It feels uplifting how the women are supportive of the girls, acknowledging there's injustice in the world and how maybe it's not as fair that they have to save the day, but they're the ones with the superpowers. And they help with equality by protecting everyone equally. This is compounded by other women of Townsville who come forward and reveal that Femme Fatale stole from and injured them, helping solidify Femme Fatale as some kind of grifter. I kind of feel the resolution would work well even without showing Femme Fatale also stealing from women, but I think they wanted to nail the point home what Femme Fatale is doing doesn't actually benefit women. If the episode ended here with the gals apprehending Femme Fatale, I think it would be an okay episode, but I really love how they approach Femme after this. We see the gals waiting outside a convention Femme Fatale's robbing, flipping Susan B. Anthony coins, and they share the stories they've learned about Susan. Watching this as a kid was my first time hearing about Susan B. Anthony, so when I heard a woman decided to go to jail for equal rights instead of being coddled, I thought it was pretty badass and it really stuck with me. I've heard others say the analogy doesn't really work because a man couldn't go to jail for voting, so it's not exactly equality for a woman to go to jail for this, and there's a weird parallel in juxtaposition of women getting arrested for voting and robbing banks. Which if you're clever enough to use the transitive property here, would mean that women voting is as bad as robbing banks. Which I think is kinda jumping the gun, but you know. I think it's an interesting introduction to feminism for a younger audience, even if it's kinda clunky in showing examples of female oppression and femme fatale is looked down on as a straw man satirizing actual feminist movements. But my enjoyment for this episode comes from the uplifting the Powerpuff Girls and Miss Bellum do, not the potential downputting of feminism or radical feminism from femme fatale. When you view the episode as more of a well-meaning mess than a straw man gotcha moment, I think it serves as a cool little episode that's maybe overhated. But at the same time, I can't blame people for hating it, cause its execution lends itself to these misinterpretations by those with bad faith. And why should anyone go out of their way to defend something most people see as a mess? With that being said, let's talk about Everyone Hates Bendy! When you think of the most hated cartoon episodes ever, it's likely you'll find the episode of Foster's where Bendy, the yellow spiky creature, comes to the home and gets everyone in trouble for no reason. But I'd like to make the argument that it's okay to hate Bendy, you're supposed to, and maybe it's okay to hate him and not the episode. Sometimes I find it kind of surprising how many people hate Blue, you know he can be selfish and stupid, but in defense of Blue and the show's creator Craig McCracken, who also created the Powerpuff Girls by the way, Craig wanted Blue to have character development in the series, but Cartoon Network didn't approve of this. In a tweet from 2021, Craig goes on to say, Sia needed Foster's episodes to be repeated in any order, so we couldn't tell chronological stories. Even though Blue may have learned his lesson in one episode, the next episode the status quo had to be reset so the characters never grew or changed. When I talked earlier about how it's a miracle any show is produced because of all that goes into it, I didn't mention one of the biggest pitfalls seems to be executive and network meddling. Animators and showrunners often perform a balancing act of their vision and story with the request of executives, who oftentimes have no idea how animation and story work. Story and character can often be secondary to the maximum profit, which oftentimes is a short-term boom that doesn't pan out in the long run due to the decline in the quality of the characters and show. One of my favorite examples of network interference comes from the book Creating Cartoons with Character by Joe Murray, the creator of Rocco's Modern Life in Camp Laszlo. In the book, he talks about how when Cat Dog was created by Peter Hannon, he was pressured to start the show out by stripping, a process in which they produce as many episodes as possible as quickly as as possible. This is done in order to play a different episode every day of the week, which in turn gets the show to syndication quicker, leading to quicker and bigger profits. This process can be pretty tunnel visioned, not only for the series quality, but for the staff behind it. As Murray goes on to say, I know a lot of the artists who are on that team, and I think they're still scraping their brains off the floor from that experience. So when people say they hate Blue, I suppose they have valid reason to feel this way, but I think it's really interesting to note how aware the creator is of this, and how there's times he couldn't do much about it. 
In making this video, I hope it's at least somewhat clear the immense talent these showrunners have, even when the shows turn out poorly, not as an excuse for the execution, but to open new perspectives and stuff. I don't hate Blue or Bendy, but it's funny how no one has ever liked Bendy for messing with Blue, who they also dislike. Cause like, you know what they say, an enemy of my enemy is still my enemy, but it's kinda cool to watch them be enemies to each other or something. So the episode starts with Bendy's family dropping him off at Foster's home for imaginary friends. As the family describes all the trouble Bendy would get into, Frankie and Mr. Harriman notice the family's son looking really guilty, suggesting he was the true culprit of their complaints, like the missing cookies or the gum under the table. In overlooking Bendy as the initial victim, we miss out on a lot of Bendy's possible motivation, which I think is one of Bendy's biggest flaws. Like, why does Bendy just walk in the room and knock over the vase, or track mud throughout the house with Wilt's shoes? It's just cruel and unusual. If we believe Bendy does this as some sort of warped survival where he believes it's either blame or be blamed, this could give Bendy a really interesting character arc, but he just kinda has too much malice, and they don't really establish much, and maybe worst of all, it's just not really funny. Whenever people blame Bendy, he just kinda cries, and that smile, that damn smile. Bendy probably has the most punchable smile next to, like, Martin Shkreli. So obviously no one believes the Fosters gang that Bendy's actually guilty, and the doubt from Frankie and Mr. Harriman is kinda like Arnold Betrays Iggy, where you just have one side constantly trying to convince a brick wall about something. I do like how the episode raises the stakes multiple times, like how they send everyone to the corners of the bedroom and they treat it as if they're in prison. You guys too? <laughs> See? Uh huh. Don't tell me. Bendy? See. Uh -huh. So the episode plays out multiple situations where the gang tries to set up Bendy, and Blue does something stupid to try and catch him, like, don't take the marker from Bendy, don't pick up the baseball bat after Bendy just broke the windows with it, don't grab the phone right after Bendy insults everyone on it. I think having the same format and punchline three or four times is laying it on a bit thick, and the structure doesn't do Bendy any services either. Also, Bendy uses Blue's toothbrush to clean the bathroom, and it makes me wonder, why does he have such a vendetta against Blue in the first place? If he was jealous of Blue, it would make a lot of sense, cause everyone wants to adopt Blue, but he just lives here and waits to see his creator every day. Whereas Bendy was kicked out of his home seemingly for the son's actions. I feel a lot of people could sympathize with Bendy with just a couple extra lines, but he comes off as more cruel and senseless. Blue intends to prove his innocence once and for all, so he sets up an elaborate series of traps, like a security camera to take photos of Bendy stealing from the cookie jar. Bendy locks himself in the bathroom to wash himself with the evidence, but Blue set up a hard read and messed with the pipes in the bathroom, causing a flood that undoubtedly exposes Bendy's series of crimes to the house. I will say I think it's a really funny concept that everyone's way more upset at Blue for flooding the house, rather than Bendy for his gaslighting, gatekeeping, and girl bossing. But it's pretty real in some ways. It's kinda like those stories you hear of people who keep getting their food eaten by coworkers, so they ask online if it's okay to put laxatives in it, which is usually responded with, with no, that could be a felony and that could be fatal, but like, you know, fuck them, I don't know, I don't care. I think the only reasonable compromise I've heard people do is replace the cream in their Oreos with tooth paste, which is pretty funny. Like, can you imagine eating that and just being like, damn, they got me. Also, do you think they still ate the chocolate wafer after that or nah? The ending of this episode isn't that satisfying. Like, Bendy never gets his comeuppance, and they never really get to explain what the heck his damage was in the first place. And why are you spray painting the camera at the end of the episode? You've been caught! You're done! Haven't you learned anything? God. I don't think the episode's supposed to make us sympathize for Bendy, but rather kind of laugh at this series of pranks, revenge, and misfortune between Bendy and Blue. Which is where the episode really falls flat for me. I feel like we've all had a situation where we've gone too far to prove we're right, going so far that the original issue paled in comparison. So that's kind of how I interpret this episode. I think it would have been better if Blue was getting his just desserts for stuff he did earlier. Like, what if Blue was putting kick-me signs on people's backs before Bendy got there? If you turn that into Blue actually getting 
blamed for these signs he didn't make later on, it could be kind of funny, like a boy who cried wolf story. But it's not. So my final thoughts on this episode are that it has a funny concept, but Benny isn't given any redeeming qualities, and I kind of like the ending, even though it's not a very satisfying traditional conclusion, kind of like the Hey Arnold episode. Benny had a lot of potential, but they never really bailed him out, and he never showed up again. These are three of my favorite cartoons of all time, and while these episodes aren't my favorites or anything, there's probably episodes I like less of each, or at a minimum, I'm more happy these episodes exist than if they never existed at all. If you like this, consider liking and subscribing, and let me know what your most hated cartoon episodes are, or maybe episodes that you like that other people hate. Alright, I'll talk to you next week. Bye!